morning. Turn to Daniel chapter 3. This is uh, part 2 of the message that I brought you last week, um, the God-given rights of the believer. Daniel chapter 3, read you another instance where, um, where the rulers decreed something and, and, and God told uh, the believer or the saint to do just the opposite. Look at uh, Daniel, Daniel chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 14. Daniel 3, 14. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour to the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, <laughs> we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. That means full of care. He didn't really care about it. We're not careful. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, I mean just in case the Lord decided not to deliver them, here's their answer. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hose, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace." Therefore, because of the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the king, was astonied and rose up in haste and spake and said unto the, his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, may you bless the message this morning. Father, may we see how, Lord, um, you're in control, that you are the, the sovereign God of the universe. And Father, even though man has free will, uh, you've determined some things, and you've determined that we have some rights. Lord, I'd like to bring out those rights that we have from the Bible. Uh, they transcend all law, all decrees, and, and all the things of man because you spoke them, and you're the highest authority there is. I pray that we'd see that. Uh, we're not looking to be rebels. Uh, we're not looking to cause trouble. But we need to obey God rather than men. I pray that you bless the message now and ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. All right. Now, some folks try, probably try to say I'm a rebel. You know... Um, I can't think of uh, Christians causing trouble, you know, except for some uh, terrorists that uh, blew up a few abortion clinics, which um, if you had anything to do with that, shame on you. Uh, you should have nothing to do with that kind of thing. We don't kill people. We don't blow up things. We preach the Word of God, and that's, that's what we're supposed to do. But we have this example here in Daniel 3 where um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were given, uh, the, the law was laid down by the king. And he says, you will worship the image that I've made. And they said, no, we won't. Now, how does that, you know, obey the powers that be? Well, listen, I believe in obeying the powers that be. And you know who the highest power is? God. Now, under that, if they're not contradicting what this book says and not contradicting what God has called uh, his saints to do, then you better obey the law. And you know, some of it you're not going to like. He tells you not to be a rebel and just obey it and do what you're told. I don't ever be, believe in being a rebel. I believe in being obedient at all times. But I'm going to be obedient to the highest authority first, okay? That's just the way it's going to be. 
Now, if you want to call me a rebel, you can. But God says I'm not. He says I'm an obedient servant. It just all depends how you're looking at the thing. Um, there are some certain things that God has wants the saints to do, and they're rights. They're things that we should be doing. We're obligated to do. We have a duty to do. We have the right to do them. I don't care. Listen, we live in America. We live under a constitution that gives us freedom of religion, and thank God for it. I wish it was as powerful as it was the, uh, when, they, when they first drafted it. It's, we're kind of losing all those rights now, but we still have that right. I'm, I'm not under any strain here this morning, at least not yet, uh, of someone coming in here and arresting me. I mean, you know, it's not happened yet. I have that freedom. But how about in other countries? What, what, if, you, what if you were a born-again, Bible-believing Christian in Iraq? Well, all of a sudden, the Bible's not... Well, that's, that has nothing to do with anything now. I'm not in America. <laughs> well, Paul's converts, were they in America? They're all over the place. And they're all over the place, and they all have different... They have different nationalities that they were under. They have different governments that they were under. Different authorities that they were under. Just like you and I. So what are our rights? Let me give you a few of them here. Number one is you have the right to praise and worship God. They told, they told Nebuchadnezzar, we will not worship your God. We're going to worship the true God. Uh, Psalm 150 verse 6 says, Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, praise ye the Lord. But only if your municipality or federal government allows it. So you don't add that in. God wants to be praised and he wants to be worshipped. And he doesn't care what the political alignment is or the situation is. God wants to be praised and worshipped. Psalm uh, 96 verse 9 says, Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. When somebody tells you, Oh, you can't worship the God of that Bible. He's a bigot. He's a racist. We're going to worship him anyway. care how you think about him. You know, he's a homophobe. I don't care what you say about him. We're going to worship him. I have the right to worship him, and I didn't get that right from my constitution. I got that right from God. You have the right to pray and petition God. In Daniel chapter 6, this happened, situation that happened to Daniel. I'm not going to read all of it, but I'm going to read a few verses of it. In Daniel 6, verse 7 to 11, it says, All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, and the princes, the counselors, and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute. Isn't that wonderful? All those big high government muckety-mucks got together to pass a law against the, the and we'll use Christian, <laughs> against the, uh, the believer, Daniel. We've got to stop this Daniel. You know, what they, you know what they were trying to do? They were trying to trap him. They were trying to trap him into something to where they could, they could, they were envious of him and they wanted to take over his position. So they made a royal statute. To make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. What kind of nonsense is that? They stopped business for seven days. All because they wanted to trap Daniel. Now, O king... Now, the king has no, he doesn't realize what's happening here. Now, the king established a decree and signed the writing. He's one of these dumb politicians that just sign things for the sake of signing them. Now, the king established a decree and signed the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. You know, they think that their, uh, their law is sovereign. Well, wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Did he obey that law? <laughs> no. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they ran to the king and said, King! King! Ah, 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 disobey the law! Then Darius bowed his head and he said, Yep. It was too late, wasn't it? 
The law of the Medes and Persians, the law that altereth not. Daniel, I got to throw you into that lion's den. Of course, throws him in there, and do the lions, do the lions uh, eat him up? Nope, they don't touch him. You know, you'd think if he'd have been against the law and doing things contrary to the uh, the powers that be, that God would have let the lions just eat him up. But he didn't. And it really wouldn't matter if they did. You know how many? You know how many? Uh, uh, men and women have lost their lives for the cause of Christ because they were considered outlaws. They were considered criminals. You know, what their, you know what their crime was? They believed a book. They preached a savior. They taught against a heresy. That was their crime. And they were put to death for that. And, our, and, and history is littered uh, with the... Um, little popes and uh, little uh, uh, dictators that were uh, a party to those killings. And they passed the laws. You know what a pogrom is, don't you? It's, it's a legalized killing. It's where, you know, the, the uh, town mayor or the governor or whoever says, you know what, for one night you can go out and kill all the Jews you want. Well, no, no. For one night you can go out and kill all the Christians you want. Think about it. You say, who in the world would do that? What happened in Russia? They had pogroms against Jews. I read a first-hand account of a man that was in a, was in a, a little tea shop having a cup of tea with a colleague when he saw a little girl running past and, and some others running past and people behind them beating them with clubs. And it was their neighbors beating the Jews. Their own neighbors. And he saw a man running after that little girl, and he knew what that man was going to do. And he come out of that diner or that little uh, place and just whap, come up and hit him right in the face and knocked him out. I'm sure God blessed him for that. You say, how could that? Be? Well, how, how how could you have six million Jews in, in in concentration camps? Somebody passed a law, man. They're doing it all the time. And they're going to do it here eventually. You know, one of these days I'm going to be an outlaw. Whether I like it or not, <laughs> I'm going to be an outlaw. I can see it coming, can't you? That if I preach this or believe this or teach this, I'm an outlaw. So be it. Not according to God. You have the right to preach the word of God. He said in 2 Timothy 4, verse 2 and 3, preach the word. Be in and in season, out of season. You know what that means? In season means when they want it. Out of season means when they don't want it. Still preaching the word. When they can take it, when they can't take it. When it, when it stirs things up and when it calms things down. Doesn't matter. Preach the word. I understand it stirs things up. The reason it stirs things up is because somebody's not right about something. Or wouldn't be stirring things up, now would it? Preach something, man, they get rabid on you. Oh, they do. Oh, they go insane. You start quoting some of that Bible. Dig it. Dig it. Curse you out and everything. What's the problem? They ought to pass a law. They ought to burn that book. You'll be long dead and gone. This book will still be here. There's been many a man thought that was going to happen and it never did. All right. But we have the right to preach the word of God. We have the right to proclaim the gospel to the lost in, in a personal witness. You have the right to witness to other people. That's a God-given right. Now, the world calls that proselyting. We call that getting people saved. I don't necessarily think it's proselyting. Uh, to a, I, I'm not proselyting people to be a Baptist. I talk to them about being saved. I invite them to the church. If they want to come here and be Baptist, they have a free will if they want to, right? Nobody forced them to. It ain't like you're born Catholic and you've got to be a Catholic. You're not born a Baptist. Well, I guess you could be born a Baptist, but, you know, there are, there are probably some of them out there. But you're not, born, you're not born saved. You have to be reborn to be saved. You have to be born again. And you have the right to proclaim that. It says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? 
As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad, uh, glad tidings of good things. So who did he send? He's sending all of you. Not just me. He's sending all of you. So we're, we're all called to preach the gospel? We're all called to preach the gospel. To every living creature. To whoever we can get to. We do it by missionaries. We do it by internet. We do it by our church and our community. Whatever way we can do it. Some are on the radio. Some are on the TV. I don't, it doesn't matter. However we can get it out there. The world can't tell us we can't do that. We won't, we won't listen to them. Why? Because our, our right and our duty before God is to go and do it. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. And he said he's given, he, he hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. There's, there, there is no federal, state, city law that can uh, take that right away. They don't have the authority. That just bugs them to death. You know, that, you know what the Pharisees didn't like? They didn't like Jesus having more authority than they did. Because, hey, he ain't, ha he ain't had his come up and yet. He hasn't, been, he hasn't been through rabbinical school like I have and how much I've studied. We don't even know where this guy went to school, do we? Did he even go to school? What good schools can be in Galilee? Huh. You know, that, that, that's, that's what it is. Envy. Um, you have the right to present yourself before the Lord in local assembly. We do it here openly every week. Nobody comes breaking down the door yet. <laughs> I say yet now because I never know. <laughs> yet. Uh, he said in Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. There's another verse in the Bible that says where they had gathered together. God wants us to gather. In fact, he commands us to gather. And the world can't say, you can't gather. We're going to gather anyway. Uh, they, they, they found ways to do it in Eastern Europe under the communist bloc. They made up all kinds of excuses to get together. They called them birthday parties. Man, they had more birthdays you can shake a stick at. But every birthday party, everybody brought their Bible and had Bible study. I don't care what we call it. I don't care where we meet, whether we meet in a field or a basement. Uh, whether we, whether we uh, meet under uh, some false pretense, doesn't matter where to meet. And the world says don't do it. We ignore the world. Why? We, have to be we, have to, we ought to obey God rather than men. You notice that all, all these things I'm talking about, there's no hurting anybody. Haven't hurt anybody. Haven't stolen anything. Haven't mistreated anyone. Why would the world even care? But they do. California gets their way, we'll all be lynched. I mean, they, they just think we're the most evil people on the planet, you know. You have the right to plant local churches anywhere on planet Earth. We're told to go and do that. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.14 says, For ye brethren became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. You know what? They found out that they weren't wanted. And maybe there was a pogrom in their community. Let's go beat up those Christians over there. You know what? I know it's not happening here, but you know it is happening in Iraq? In, in Pakistan? I, I, don't know how you can, I don't know how you can walk safely down the road in Pakistan and be a Christian. And in Africa, in places in Africa, there are countries there that, I mean, it's, a, it's dangerous acknowledging the name of Jesus Christ. And when you get together to worship, you better be looking behind your back. We got it made here. Well, at least right now. Maybe these days, one of these days we'll be looking behind our back. Maybe we'll be looking over our shoulder. Maybe you'll look under your car when you go out there and you're done with the service. <laughs> Maybe you will. You say it won't happen here. I don't know about that. A lot of other things I thought would never happen have happened. But we have the right to plant local churches. 
In 2 Thessalonians 1, 4, he says, So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Trouble. Trouble. And there's going to be trouble. And there's going to be persecutions. And just because the law or the powers that be say you can't exist, I'm afraid God says we are to exist. And we are to gather. We are to meet. We are to worship. We are to praise. We are to pray. We are to preach. We are to do all those things. Those are the, the inalienable rights of the believer. Now here's the last one. This is the only one that kind of stands out with all the rest. Or stands out from all the rest. You have the right to protect your person, your progeny, your property against wicked persons who would do you or yours harm. You have the right. You say, where do you get that from? Luke twenty two thirty six. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his scrip, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Why would he tell you to do that? Why would he tell his disciples to buy a sword? To defend themselves? To def you say, well, is that really what we're supposed to be doing? I'm, you know, we're not passive, we're peaceful. The Bible says, you know, with all that lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. With all that lieth in you. That means we will try just about everything to live peacefully with our neighbors, with our friends, with our government. We'll try to live peacefully with them. But we're not passive. He said, well, aren't we to turn the other cheek? In relation for the, for the witness of Christ? Yes! But not everything is about the witness of Christ. Not everything is about, you know, when, when, the, uh, when the thief comes to your house to break in and steal and threaten the, the welfare of your family, it's not about the witness of Christ. And it's not about to turn the other cheek. We are meek. But we will go to war. Don't we go to war? For, uh, Baptists aren't conscientious objectors, as far as I know. A Bible-believing Christian is not a conscientious objector. He will fight for his nation. We're not, we're not, I mean, but yet, do we want to fight? Well, of course not. Do we want to mix it up and shoot people? No. We want to be the meek. We, want, we, we prefer peace over war anytime. You'd be crazy not to. Not a warmonger. But we ended up going to war. We're harmless. The Bible talks about being uh, the harmless sons of God. We're harmless, but we're armed and ready. Will you get hurt from me? Not if you're not trying to hurt me or my wife or my children. Why would I hurt you? I wouldn't harm a hair on your head. Why would I? Never been tempted to. Well, I want to choke a few church members. Can't say there's not that desire there sometime. But, you know, I, I, have, I have no, there's not a single desire in my mind to hurt someone that I'm trying to win. Unlike maybe a, a, some crazy Muslim that might hold, hold you at, uh, you know, a, a sword to your throat and say convert or die and that what they believe. I mean, don't tell me it's not what they believe. It's what they believe. It's called conversion at, at the point of a, a sword. We don't. Do we do that? Hand you a packet? I don't, you might cut your finger on the paper maybe, you know. Get a paper cut and say that we, you know, tried to kill you. I, you know. We're pretty harmless, don't you think? How many of you are hurting people out there? Beating people up? How many? Come on. Fess up. Who's beating up who? I'm not beating up anybody. You find examples of these things in the Old Testament where... You know, and of course, a nation that wants to strip you of your right to be armed, and by the way, <laughs> you're getting toward the end of your nation when that happens. I mean, that's exactly what Adolf Hitler did when he went in and came to power. He took away the weapons. Why? That way he can run the people. Because, you know, after a while, people realize that you're a dud. They realize you're a killer. They realize you're a cancer. 
Well, if you're unarmed, there's not too much you can do about it. So you just pass gun laws and disarm everybody. If you go and look, and just take a look, just, just you, you know, just go, go, to, go to the internet, Google genocide, read about it. The genocides that have gone, the millions of people that have been murdered by their own government or by some other totalitarian system that, you know, wanted to put them under their heel. Go read about it. They're all disarmed. They're all unarmed because they can't defend themselves. You know, why your, you know why your forefather said you were to be armed and gave you the Second Amendment? So that a tyrannical government couldn't do to you what it's done to millions. Millions upon millions. It happened in Russia. It happened in China. It's happened in the Middle East. It's happened in Africa. It's happened everywhere. And the only thing that keeps it from happening here is we're armed. But you know what? The government didn't give me that right. They may have acknowledged that right, but they're not the ones that gave it to me. The Bible gave me that right. Defend your families. We're not aggressive, but we'll defend our families aggressively. I think that's the duty of any man. All right. One more thing. The unsaved. Can't forget about them. They're only about, what, 95% of the population outside the saved here, maybe? Maybe 98? What do they got? They got one right. One. 1 Timothy 2, 4 to 6, Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. They have the right to be saved. Now, they don't even deserve that right. I didn't deserve that right. But they have it to exercise or ignore. And because they have that right to be saved, we have that obligation to present. Christ didn't die on that cross in vain. He, did, he, did, he didn't allow himself to, be, uh, uh, to become sin so that we could just ignore the rest of the world and not try to win as many as we can. The Father is willing to save. The Son is willing to save. God is willing to save all that will come to him. John 6.37 says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. God's just not picking and choosing and saying, Well, I don't know if I want you. You know, you just, I don't think you fit. You're not the caliber I like. God saves anybody, man. I mean, he saves them from, from every spec, spectrum of the human element. <laughs> you, uh, God saves the worst. He saves the, the very best that we hold up. And God can even save politicians and lawyers and Hollywood stars. Who would have believed that? Huh? And the mafia, yeah. He can save heretics if they get right with God. I mean, he can, he, can save, he can save to the uttermost. They have that right. Thank God they have that right. But you know what? That's all they got. They're not going to do the rest of them. They can care less about the rest of them. Those are our rights. This is our world one day. So next time you think about it, you know, when all of our... You notice I didn't mention none of the rights that, except for maybe the Second Amendment, right? None of the rights that our government gives because... Your government gave them to you, and your government can take them away. <laughs> you know, if they declare, uh, they declare martial law, they suspend the Constitution for a time, or they just kind of put it on hold, and guess what you have? No rights. Can't suspend this. Only God can say, okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change things. And he'd have to take us all out of here to do it, which is fine with me. All right. Let's all stand.